a question for uh, both, both Thomas and, and Bill. Um, our event brings together um, uh, engineers as well as uh, social scientists, both on speakers uh, on the program as, as well as our committee. And um, of course, there are some uh, proposals going into NSF where, where there's partnerships between social scientists and 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 uh, uh, and uh, natural scientists or physical scientists, uh, biological scientists, uh, as well as engineers and and historians and sociologists and economists. But it seems like it's still relatively rare that that's occurring. And and I'm wondering um, if the two of you can comment on that. If you think that there's a way that NSF could incentivize uh, greater uh, social scientific and and scientific um, and engineering collaboration. Bill, do you want to start with this? One? I'm sure you have a lot to say. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to, Thomas. Thanks. Um, you know, NSF some time ago stood up its Science for Science policy program, which really was unique across the spectrum. Uh, no other agency was thinking along those lines, and uh, you know that provided a tremendous kind of spur to this integration between you know social science and and uh, and science and engineering fields to really begin to think think together and you know that's obviously a modest program but i think it's been a significant one with these new you know what i called in my talk uh, industrial innovation policy thrusts that I, nsf is now faced with with the passage of the chips and science act um, as well as steps that NSF itself is taking over the years. Um, I think this whole ability to integrate social, with social science becomes, uh, becomes more and more critical. It's an old debate in NSF, um, and it's, you know, and there have been ups and downs about this debate, with this, but with this kind of broader role where societal impacts really have to be understood and analyzed. Um, I think there's going to be a greater need. So, I mean, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, for example, took into account a lot of those uh, societal effects, obviously environmental effects, but also larger effects in a, in a collaborative cross-agency kind of effort. And I think that we'll need to strive for in the, these new TIP programs, these technology development programs at NSF, we're going to need to strive for more of that. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to butcher the quote, but a kind of a, a quote that's been said around my, my department a lot is that engineering is too important to be left to the engineers. I mean, because there's it touches so much of our lives. Um, I have smartphones everywhere, digital technologies everywhere, and it needs to have social scientists involved. It needs to have people who understand how people work with, with each other to make this technology. And if all we care about is the speed or the processing power, or then we will miss something important. So I, I think it's even more critical that we continue to make sure that social scientists, humanities are involved in these two new technologies. And there's different initiatives to bring people together. The challenge is always engineers and social scientists and humanities, we can work differently. You know, we, we have different languages. And so make sure we break down those barriers, these language barriers. I mean, obviously, each of these people are very smart. It's not about how smart you are. It's just a matter of how you describe things and understand the world. And so find more forums to do that. Um, Zoom is great, but I think sometimes being in person actually helps with that more. So I think hopefully one day we can do more and more face-to-face -face things because I think it's great to have these communications, be able to see people and interact with people in a coffee break, those those type of things is very very helpful, um, but it's 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 so important that these social scientists are involved. And again, this is something that's been discussed for decades. You know, the two cultures. You know, C. P. Snow wrote about this in the fifties and sixties. And so again, this is not a new concept, but it's a hard concept. It's, we've we continually need to work at making sure different disciplines are involved in these decisions. Mm -hmm. 
One, one topic that, uh, that both of you uh, brought up um, was uh, global issues. And, and um, I am interested in your, your thoughts on um, to, to what degree is kind of the original um, mandate and, and, and kind of the evolution of, of uh, NSF as a national uh, agency, uh, has, has that held it back uh, from, from doing more in terms of um, uh, supporting global research? And, and certainly there are some um, programs within uh, NSF that um, address global issues. But as, as uh, Thomas pointed out, um, many of the greatest problems facing uh, the world are are global problems, and 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 that will be even more true uh, with climate science and 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 uh, global warming and 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 other uh, and water resources and other issues in the future. So, I'm wondering if you could um, talk about um, it, would it be uh, advantageous for uh, the National Science Foundation to think even more globally, and how might it do that? In Bill's thoughts, because he really kind of deals with these global issues of, of kind of science policy at that scale. Um, you know, the NSF does, the NSF's in a tricky place because, in one sense, they are the National Science Foundation of the USA. So I think there is importance and value of them trying to focus on problems that impact our population. I think it's important for to focus on problems that impact our whole population because the USA is a very diverse place. And so something that impacts Nebraska and California and Texas and New York are very different problems. And so if the, U if the NSF can make sure we tackle those problems well, that would be a, a good thing. Um, but then, but course, I think as Jeffrey said, the, we need to look internationally. Again, these are global problems. We cannot solve climate change by ourselves. We cannot solve the population issues. You know, pe people will We'll be moving around. Um, water, clean water, those issues, we need to have a global scope. So making sure that the NSF and the, and the, the federal government understands that we can need to look globally. Um, and then, of course, this issue of ch competition in China, right? I think we, we realize that this is something that's there. And how do we make sure that we can cooperate on, I think uh, the current administration is saying, cooperate where we can, compete where we have to, that kind of mantra. Um, and so thinking about those issues as well. Um, what, what do you think, Bill? How, how do you approach this, this issue of, of international, this internationalization of science? Well, Thomas, thanks for your good start on this. Um, you know, it's obviously a very tricky problem. NSF, is, as all of us know, um, in, this, uh, in this symposium has long had in an international office currently headed by Kendra Sharp, uh, that pays a lot of attention and collaborates internationally with science. And that's an important shop in NSF. I mean, Congress, because of the politics of taxpayer funding, is not going to you know, start funding a huge host of international um, research escapades. It's frankly a political reality here. And I would argue, too, it's not bad to have a national focus, but we've just got to be able, to, given the level of problems and challenges we've got, but we've got to be able to kind of reach outside and open that window, um, I think, in a variety of ways. One is that we don't do a good job at all in the United States of tracking advances that are going on elsewhere. Uh, we do a decent job of tracking our own system. But we don't do a good job of where the advances are coming from elsewhere. And that, in a period of increasing technological competition, I think that's going to be increasingly important. So a whole analytical capability to figure out where advances are coming from and what's behind them to better help us keep up, um, I think is going to be key because we don't understand that territory very well. So I think that's one area where NSF, working with other agencies, frankly, um, can, uh, can be helpful. Commerce, I think, is going to be charged with an increasing role in this territory, but it can't only be kind of a single agency focus. Um, and then there's just the plain need for international collaborations because we're not the only people doing advances. 
and we're going to have to find some better ways to connect with them. Um, you know, countries organize their innovation systems, uh, at least the governmental contributions to their innovation innovation systems, on a national basis. Uh, it's a it's a, an underlying reality. But you know, we found, for example, during the pandemic, that it was crucial for the U.S. to be deeply engaged with WHO. It was crucial for the U.S. to be in, deeply engaged with um, with the EU, and we paid a penalty when we weren't. Um, you know, I note that DARPA is very interesting work more than a decade ago now on, on really furthering mRNA vaccines, where DARPA was an early investor, frankly, NIH was not. In fact, it, it would, wasn't ready to support that high-risk stuff, DARPA was. But one of DARPA's original group of companies was not just Moderna, but also CureVac in Germany, right? Because CureVac was on some very interesting kind of advances. So we need to find ways to make room to team up with real contributors uh, where we need to. So I think technology analysis worldwide is a big gap area. We need to understand what's evolving both in opportunity space as well as competitive space. And we need to find better ways to team up. Again, recognizing that, that science funding is gonna be predominantly national. We need to find ways to team up with re great researchers in other fields. And look, Thomas, a lot of your work, international work, is a great example for what some of those opportunities are. Yeah, and one thing that, to toot our own horn a little bit, the USA, we're viewed as world leaders in science. And so people want to work with our scientists. People want to come to America to study and work. And so make sure that we are open to that. We have good policies to let people come into the country and work and study. And you know, that's very critical to keep, keep, keep those, those channels open because uh, I think that we are well-placed for that. People do look to the USA for lots of leadership in science and making sure we keep that leadership going. And I think that it comes through funding. It comes through um, solving some global challenges and being at the forefront of those challenges, um, being willing to, I think some of it's uh, humility, understand, okay, we don't know everything, making sure when we do work in another country, they won't come saying, hey, I'm from America, I'm from a fancy university, let me solve your problems. But saying, university in America, I have some skills, but you have the local knowledge. What's going on there? And once you have those communications, then you can say, okay, what problems are you having? How can I best serve and help you? And having that humility is very is very um, important. Um, I've been on I've I've been in the field a lot, and I see both happen. There's many times where scientists go there and build a bridge to nowhere, or build some type of um, cooking stove that doesn't seem to work, uh, some solar, solar panel project that doesn't work. And so being mindful of when we do these projects, um, who we're working with and why. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, Bill, you detailed the origins of the National Science Foundation and, and of course was born um, in a time of the, the Cold War and and, um, and uh, the um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could uh, compare and contrast. Uh, you all, well, you also mentioned um, the need to balance uh, staying at the forefront of science and technology, but also broadening resources, so centers of excellence and research, uh, but but also um, uh, economic regions. Um, and I'm wondering if you could discuss. Um, uh, perspectives of the National Science Foundation uh, uh, in, in the early and later Cold War, uh, the fifth generation in the early 80s with Japan and, and concerns about uh, AI uh, investment uh, by um, uh, the Ministry of Industry and Trade in uh, Japan and today's concerns about China and their uh, um, science and technology and, and kind of put this in the context of um, one of the National Science Foundation's um, missions and mandates is, is, is national defense. Sure. I mean, it's, it's obviously becoming an increasingly important uh, discussion as the kind of geopolitical competition picks up again. Uh, the 
you know, NSF got created at a, at a moment when, you know, just prior to the Cold War, uh, really becoming starkly clear to, to everyone, right? Really with the beginning of the Korean War. Uh, but it was created on a post-war model on the Vannevar Bush kind of frame of basic research. And then the Cold War hit and the Defense Department had to stand up a whole set of uh, new research capabilities from the Office of Naval Research to uh, and, and scaling that up to, to uh, a DARPA capability, uh, which got created when Sputnik came around. So um, again, we were running two different systems, defense and non-defense. Non that inherently is a very inefficient activity. Uh, and it, you know, limer, it limits the the two way street that optimal science organization really requires, where the technology advance informs the science advance, and vice versa. Um, so there's a deep organizational model here um, that the Cold War uh, kind of illuminated for us, um, and I think the current technological competition that we're facing with China, where frankly, the stakes are extremely high. Um, you know, we're seeing once again, a challenge between two very different perspectives on, on governance and liberty, um, you know, at hand. And, you know, whatever we do, we're going to have to lessen um, you know, lessens the effect of that competition, but that if the effect of that competition is not going to be lessened by the U.S. falling behind, frankly. And we're going to have to find a way to keep up. And we're competing with an economic model that is very different from ours. China is a country that is run by engineers. Uh, we certainly, alas, are not. Benefits and deficits to that point. But, um, for example, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about manufacturing. In the post-World War II period, Japan, um, Germany had to focus on getting their economies back in shape. They, they, their economy, they, they weren't eating, right? They didn't have food. They had to get their industrial base stood up again, right? They focused on what we could call in a manufacturing-driven innovation systems. They focused their innovation systems on strengthening their industrial base. They pursued a more of an industrial policy approach. The United States, Vannevar Bush coming out of World War II, the United States was king of manufacturing. Going into the war, we had eight times the production capacity of Japan and at least four times the production capacity of Germany going into the war. You can only imagine the numbers coming out after that great war mobilization period. So, Vannevar Bush didn't have to think about manufacturing scale up. That was the least of his worries. He focused on a perceived weakness of the United States, which was on the science side. The United States was not king of science in the, in the pre-war period. We built tremendous capacity during the war, and Bush wanted to hang on to that. So that was his orientation. But we left out of that mix what you know our competitors, Japan and Germany, are doing, which was a manufacturing based innovation system. Now, it's very good to have a science-based innovation system. There's huge strengths and advantages to it. But that doesn't mean we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Could we add to that a manufacturing innovation capability? We haven't done that. Um, and as a result, the United States is now no longer the industrial leader of the world. China definitely is. China has pursued, as Korea, as Taiwan did, a manufacturing-based innovation system. Uh, the U.S. has not, and that is now catching up to us. And we're going to have to start thinking about building both and strengthening our science-based innovation system, but also adding to that a manufacturing innovation system focus as well. I think one thing America has on our side is that we have lots of friends. Um, you. Europe, South Korea, China. I mean, there's lots of people around the world who really want America and will partner with, the, partner with us to do innovation, to do manufacturing, to, to make these technologies. And so, so I think that's a positive thing that we have that we don't want to lose. As the world does globalize, I think it will be multipolar, right? We have China, we have the USA. 
Um, but there's just more pe people out there, more players out there. And so understanding South Korea's needs and what they need, um, obviously technology there, and how can we work with South Korea to um, do wonderful research? And same thing with Japan. Again, top research, top development there. Uh, how do we utilize what they're doing, um, work together to uh, make sure that we have top manufacturing? Um, because as, as the world geopolitics changes, um, we, need to, we need to have friends. And I think having those friends around the world can be very useful. Thank you. I'll, I think I'll uh, switch to some audience questions now. Um, uh, could you provide examples of failed innovation initiatives uh, and best practices for what not to do? So what, what can, to paraphrase, what can we learn from failure studies and do we do failure studies enough? Uh, Bill, do you wanna start? Sure, I mean, I can jump into that. Um, you know, in the in the climate energy territory, um, we unfortunately have a long history of failed demonstration projects on the energy technology side. Right, we ran into that. Um, you know, things like the Clinch River Breeder Reactor, a whole set of um, energy technologies in the 1980s that failed because you know, we hadn't anticipated a huge drop in the price of oil. Um, so the whole sin fuels effort and the demonstrations around those uh, went down. Um, the famous Solyndra episode um, where the Department of Energy loan office guaranteed loans for a thin, a very innovative thin film solar technology. It was competing with um, heavily subsidized you know, China, Chinese technology and um, solar PV panels. Uh, the better technology didn't win. Solyndra went down, uh, exposing the loan guarantees that the federal government had entered. Now, the federal government didn't lose money on that one, uh, but it was an example of not getting that demonstration stage right. And we've had plenty of examples in carbon capture and sequestration projects in recent years uh, that have not um, where the demonstrations have not in turn spawned um, industrial acceptance, industrial implementation. So it's that's a very, very tricky stage that we're going to have to work on getting right, particularly since we just passed the Inflation Innovation Act, um, Inflation Reduction Act, which calls for you know $375 billion worth of new technology implementation. I am kind of, kind of in the question, failed engineering projects. Um, I brought up a few in my presentation, the Titanic. Uh, I was, before this presentation, I was bringing up on some of the history of the Titanic. And a lot of the problems there were, you see repeat over and over and over again. They had to get this ship out there fast. There was this, this time deadline. And so they didn't do all the safety checks. They didn't do all the, what they should have done to make sure it was all operational like they thought it would be. Um, not listening to people. There was warnings of maybe an iceberg that was out there and someone called in and said, oh, don't worry about it. And so heeding these warnings that, that come to engineers, um, sometimes engineers aren't very good at that. We don't listen to other people. We don't listen to outside perspectives. And so I think one thing engineers need to do better is engaging with the, the people, engaging with the decision makers. So before you go off and design a new airplane, a new toy, a new gadget, anything. Talk to people in the community. Talk to people in the environment. How will it impact their lives? And so people need to be involved in these decision-making, this, the, the research and the decision-making stages. Um, it's too late to all of a sudden have a prototype develops, get to the final stage and say, oh, yes, I should talk to A, B, C, D, right? Get them very involved in the beginning. You can solve many of your problems early on. Um, again, the, the diverse, again that, that kind of brings up the diversity of opinions. Again, you want, don't just want to have the same old people in the room, but have people from all over the place to be involved. Um, engineers often have this mindset of kind of moving fast and breaking things quickly and kind of just rolling over people. And so 
rethinking that sometimes those stereotypes about engineers to think how do we best make sure that we are um, inclusive and understanding of other folks. Those are kind of my, some of my thoughts on field engineering projects. Here's a very broad question that, um, that plays right to the, uh, the theme of and title of the, the session. Um, what in your view has been the most extraordinary engineering impact on society uh, uh, in your field of engineering over the past 50 years? I mean, I'll, uh, go, go, go for, I mean, I'll, I'll pass, let's say, let's say um, 60 years, man, I think the internet has really been transformative. I mean, I that's probably an easy, an easy answer to say. Not many too many people would argue with the impact of the internet um, and this connectivity. Um, we can do these things, the fact that the way smartphones are developing, I think that will, you know, we talked about the, you know, the steam engines, we talked about electricity, the automobile, I think the internet is that that same scale and that formative technology that is really impacting how we do everything, whether it's our communications, like right now, our transportation, you call an Uber. First thing you do when I get to a new location is look at my smartphone. It's probably the thing I keep next to me more than anything else is my smartphone and a bottle of water or something like that. It's just, you have <laughs> to have that whenever you travel anywhere is, is that those technologies. So, um, you know, that, that comes to my mind immediately, but maybe Bill has a better perspective of something that's more insightful. No, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you, Thomas. I mean, you know, our, our society goes through a series of major innovation waves, you know, every 40 to 50 years or so. And certainly the ones that the ones that's dominated our all lives is this whole information technology wave. Um, you know, we're starting to see, I think, some fascinating developments and we saw a lot during the pandemic with these new mRNA vaccines, but is there going to be an innovation wave around the whole integration between um, engineering, physical sciences and life sciences, the convergence area? I note that that's one of NSF's 10 big idea areas um, and spawned by, frankly, some some great thinking early on by some folks at NSF, including Mike Rocco, um, is this is this c convergence that we're seeing in the life sciences with the physical engineering sciences? Is that going to lead to the next big wave here, and how encompassing will that be? Yeah, I, I, my background is electrical engineering, so it's it's easy for me to think about those innovations. But I think you know synthetic biology, some of these new biological technologies, it'll be so interesting to see how that develops in the next 10, 20 years. What types of new medicines are developed? I mean, the COVID vaccine really, they were working on for, I mean, the technology for a long time, but we see it automatically how important it is. How, it, I mean, without that, who knows where we would be in this pandemic? And so seeing how other health technologies can really transform our lives, whether it's finding cures for cancer, um, finding cures for some of these um, orphan diseases, these, these things that we don't think about much, but I think the health scientists, there's lots of power there that can make major transformations. So um, I, if, maybe as an engineer, we're very optimistic about the future, but it will be cool to see the world in 10, 20, 30 years to see what's going to happen. I think there's more to come. And because we have this connectivity, because there's more people out there working, I think we can do even more innovations. I think the more people out there trying to solve problems, you can have this exponential growth in type of knowledge and, and development. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Thomas, you mentioned um, algorithmic bias and, and Sophia Noble's done such incredible work and, and, um, and uh, the, uh, the magnitude of the problem in, in um, finance, car carceral systems, and and um, search just um, permeates a society. And um, I, obviously, um, large uh, IT corporations are making certain decisions on large language models, and and um, but um, and, and in many ways, it seems like 
uh, an issue of regulation, but do you see um, opportunities for an organization like the NSF uh, to, to ha have a strong positive impact? And, and uh, if so, what what might um, what might be the means for it to to have that impact? Yeah, I think play, organizations like the NSF play a critical central role. Um, Google, Microsoft, Apple, they have a different structure, different motivation, right? <laughs> they want to make money, right? That is the, the goal of these companies. And so the NSF and scientists working with NSF, the, what their goals are, are are very different. And so I think scientists working in these laboratories can take a step back and saying, hey, where are some of the broader um, societal impacts of this technology um, that uh, these big tech companies may not prioritize. It's kind of maybe in the back of their minds. They may have some people on their staff who worry about that, but that's not their main goal. And so I think the NSF can make that a major goal. We can make say, hey, we really want to make sure this technology is safe. We want to make sure it protects people's privacy and is fair to people around the world and people in the USA. And so they can have that mandate to do that, that companies can't do. So I think um, th that's one powerful thing about the NSF. Also, a lot of these data systems, let's say Google or, or Facebook and Yahoo, they have lots of data. That, that's what makes them so powerful is that they have so much data. And so the NSF is a very large organization. And so maybe they, we can use our weight to get some more data and really be more powerful. If it's just a individual scholar or their own lab, they may not be able to collect as much data. But the NSF, they could get 50 scholars, 100 scholars all together working on these problems and these, and these projects that scale is something that a central agency like the NSF can do very well. And I think that will allow the agency to compete with large companies who have lots of data as well. So I think that could be something very powerful. I mean, just to add a thought to that, I, mean, I've, I talked in my talk about the importance of adding an applied use-based science model to our basic research model. But let me just emphasize that that basic research model remains key. And it's, it remains key to our science-based innovation system. Uh, so our ability to do revolutionary breakthroughs is, is dependent in very significant extent on our basic science capability and our ability to then transfer those revolutions into, uh, into implementation and to reality. Uh, obviously, we need to get better at that second stage, but remaining strong at that basic research revolutionary possibility area is key. And, and on that on that Google example, I mean, NSF was the funder of that original search engine research um, that Google's founders later built on. So, uh, you know, we always need to keep in mind the importance of that basic side and keep that strong as we work on making better connections, really a left-right kind of model so that the left side of the innovation pipeline is better connected to the right side as we create that stronger two-way pipeline, hopefully, um, we still need to retain the basic side, of course. And of course, you no, know, there's the NSF, but you no, know, people like yourselves, the National Academies, this, there's a role for people who at the National Academies or the NIH to, to be involved in these discussions as well, because you know, the National Academies may not be able to have lots of, they don't have workforce, but the people involved in national academies can write these, these, these policy briefs and be involved in shaping the policy decisions of the politicians and, and of the scientists. And so, um, and making sure that these issues are brought to the forefront and not left behind for profit motivations. And so keeping them in our minds is very useful and important. And so thinking about some of the other policy institutions that surround the NSF, that surround the NSF, how, how those can be used to solve some of these digital problems as well. It's very important to think about. This is a question that uh, previous answers you've given have touched a bit on, but um, from your vantage, uh, what do you see as the most important opportunity or priority for uh, the engineering directorate in the years and decades to come um, to, to have truly transformative and inclusive technology.
Thomas, you want to start with that one? I'll join in. Yeah. Always <laughs> a hard one. My, my, my first thought, again, if you ask me in an hour, it may change. But what came to my mind immediately was the people. I'm making sure you have diverse people involved. The science and the engineering, you know, it's made for us. It's not made for, I mean, it's made for us to use and enjoy and to do well. And so making sure we train people well, making sure that we have people from across the country, from different states, different regions, different backgrounds involved in the science. I think if we can train people, get them involved in science and excited about engineering, I think that we can make some cool stuff. We can make, develop awesome things because we have people who are, are there and, and excited about science and engineering. So that's my first thought about making sure we just, we continue, we don't let that mission slide for what we do. I think if we keep that in, in the mix there, uh, then I think some of the other things will, will happen. And of course, money, we need more funding, more funding, more funding, more funding. I think so much of what we do revolves around funding, let's say funding scholarships. We need funding students, funding grad students, getting these uh, career awards, getting these um, you know, awards for young scholars so, so they don't have to wait till they're 50 years old before they get the first major grant. Right? These are very important things to do for, for, for science. So that's my first thought. So I'll, I'll turn to Bill. Again, his wisdom and ideas is very useful. Thomas, I'd, let me just emphasize your talent point. I mean, I think this is, there's a huge opportunity space, I think, uh, for engineering at NSF, uh, because inherently engineering is going to be more connected to the applied side, um, not only the basic side. Uh, so as a society, as we undertake more of this connected R&D, R&D that leads to development, um, we're going to need a whole new set of skills. Um, and engineering you know, already specializes in some of these. So, you know, as I said before, to make this leap from basic science to implementation, we're going to need change agents, people that can think about how to connect the research foundations, as I said, uh, to implementation, people who can think about the manufacturing foundations, people that can, can map supply chains, people that can undertake testing and demonstration. Um, people that can under you know manage flexible contracting mechanisms, who can think about technology scale up financing. Uh, engineering in the end is about doing, and a lot of these are doing skills. So I think engineering at, at NSF can play a key role in developing the new talent education we're going to need to take on this expanded task beyond NSF's and non-defense sciences historic focus on basic research. There, there certainly has been a significant focus uh, of, of NSF in, in, in broadening uh, funding for um, uh, trying to reach uh, underrepresented uh, groups early in K through 12. But um, do, you, do you think uh, there needs to be even more and, and that uh, that's a that's a key and perhaps more partnerships with science museums across the country and and um and, and other institutions as well i think i think more is important i mean if you ask about diversity in stem if you go back 20 years the problem is there we, we tried to address it we, tr we went to fix it go back 30 years the problem is there and so this problem has been there for a long time we've been trying to address it for a long time and if you look at, let's say, women in, in women in engineering, you no, know, still not the great great numbers there. Um, so I, it's a continual problem, and solving this problem has been a wicked problem. We talk about wicked problems, and it's been truly a wicked problem of how do you solve this issue? And of course, this, this goes beyond just what NSF can do. I mean, this is you know the whole education system has to be thought about. Um, housing, education. I mean, there's, there's, it's all tied in so many different ways. But um, yeah, it's it's a uh, one of these wicked problems that we we keep trying to solve and makes makes baby steps, but sometimes those baby steps seem a little too slow. So, I mean, just one thought to add to Thomas's good points. 
I worry a lot about our technical workforce. And as Thomas pointed out earlier, it's not just the engineering world that we need to worry about. We need to worry about the technical skills by a whole range of our population. And that's another dimension here for diversity in exactly the same kind of ways that Thomas was discussing, extending that thinking not only to um, the engineering world, but to a world that needs to, to get a handle on and get access to a whole set of technical skills that are going to enable them to thrive as these new technologies keep descending on, on our economy. Um, that's a major project because we don't have, we really do not have a workforce education system in the country. A bunch of European countries do to their, frankly, significant benefit. We don't have that here. Um, you know, we focused on uh, college education. And for a while, we assumed that we would reform everything by sending everybody to college. And then we didn't. And we're stuck with the results. We dismantled much of our vocational education system in the process. Um, and we really, I think, are going to have to address the skilled technical workforce side in ways that we, we really haven't before, if we're going to get to the kind of diversity that we really need. Well, thank you so much, Thomas and Bill, for your great insights, your wonderful talks, and it was such a pleasure to be part of this conversation with you today. I, I thank you both, and um, and so does uh, our our committee and and the National Academies. So, thank you.